Alrighty then, and welcome back. I have one more drone to build for the carrier, and this one I want to be more of a fighter-style attack craft, although oddly I want it to be attacking large vehicles rather than small vehicles. I don't believe that air superiority fighters have a place in the meter meta, especially if they're being accompanied by larger vehicles. A larger stationary vehicle like the carrier with a high stability should be using lasers to fly swat enemy vehicles, and I don't want to use air superiority fighters fighters for that role. If you don't have hit scan or energy weaponry, now it might be a little bit of a different game because getting on an enemy's tail or getting close to them may be far more valuable than it would be with hit scan weaponry. However, I am using hit scan weaponry, so I find very little value in these fighters. If you're doing like World War II or modern vehicle designs, or even World War I designs, you might find a lot more value in these, but I do not. So since I want to build a fighter, the first thing is, well, how small can I actually make this and still get away with it? Here I have a one by one cross section, two by two, etc. And these are two dimensional. They're just cross sections of a plane. And I have wood being the juicy interiors and metal being the tough exterior. And I'm looking at the ratios between the two. And as you'd expect, the wood goes up as a square and the metal's linear. Anyone who's played from the depths knows that the bigger your craft is, the less skin it has compared to the interior, so the more you can afford to armor it. Now, there are nuances to armoring, like you armor a front sider differently from a broad sider, differently from a fighter. This is just a very general appearance graph, and it's really tuned more towards the fighter that I'm building, because this fighter is only gonna have one, level, one layer of armor at the most. It's not gonna specialize into more armor to protect any given area, because it's going to be moving around and twisting and maneuvering, and it could really get shot anywhere. Now, we do see the crossover happen somewhere between 4 and 5 meters. The crossover is not interesting, though. What is interesting, and by crossover I mean where we finally have more interior than exterior, what I find interesting is what's the lowest ratio that I'm willing to accept? For me personally, that's 3 by 3 I might bump that up to 4x4 four four if I built even width or even height craft, I don't, so I'm not going to use it. However, I could see it as being a very valid choice to build craft that are roughly on this scale. Instead, I'm going to choose this scale. I'm going to use about a 3x3 three three box. Often I'll build weapon systems first and then decide how to package them. In this case, I think the pack packaging is very important, so I'm going to start with that first. Some people prefer building one way, some people prefer building other ways. If I really want a craft to look or feel a certain way, I'll sketch out the size of the craft first. If I really want the craft to uh, carry a certain armament, or it needs to have certain internal specs, whether it's weapons or energy generation or detection, ECM, anything, I'll build the interiors first and then I'll wrap them. It's really a question of what I want. And as I get more experience building specific types of vehicles, I'll be able to tell ahead of time what the interior volume of the vehicle will look like based on the needs that I have, and then I can sort of meld the two and have them be more codependent. So the next thing is drive layout. For the bomber, I did a four engine configuration, which uses differential thrust, which is pretty inefficient, but I kind of wanted to do that that way. I also do kind of regret it. It would just be better if it had a big block of engines using thrust vectoring in the center. But you know, you, you build what you want. This time, I'm gonna take the opposite approach. I'm gonna be building a big thrust stick in the center and that'll use thrust vectoring. So because there's just a one of these, it'll be able to vector pitch, pitch being this way or yaw very effectively. If I do it in this configuration, it can vector pitch or it can vector roll very efficiently. Depending on how far out I place these and how far forward slash back they are compared to the center of mass, I may be able to get some yaw thrust vectoring in, but it will not be as efficient as it would be if these were centrally mounted. So for this vehicle, I don't need it to fly in a scale manner. If I need it to fly in a scale manner like World War II style or real world jets, I might do a configuration either closer to this or maybe slightly centered, and then it would be more reliant on pitching and rolling to fly. 
I don't care about that. So I'm gonna have the thing just fly flat and it'll maneuver by yawing and pitching and it'll have roll stability, but it won't have much roll authority. Additionally, I'm not gonna build it like a crayon. Building it like a crayon would be more efficient. Instead, for looks, I think I want to do two three by three weapon pods that come out the front like this. Now, those have a little bit less interior volume than a single five by five blob, and they have more surface area, and they'll have more frontal area as well. So just sticking a five by five blob onto the front of this and making a big crayon would be more efficient. And if you want to build for efficiency, and you're making similar design decisions otherwise, I would suggest doing that. I really don't want to do that here, and I don't think that I'm making many sacrifices. In some way, it will be a bit more redundant, because I plan on making it be at least theoretically able to operate with only one of these two pods remaining. Again, I don't actually think that's worthwhile. I think one centrally mounted block would be better, but as always, you build what you want. So next, let's move on to the weapon design. So the remaining consideration is what weapon it should be carrying. So I put together a small platform with all of the weapon choices. Noticeably absent is plasma. And the reason it's absent is because everything else on the carrier has plasma. And one of plasma's big downsides is that it can't actually efficiently disable things. So, and because it just takes a big chunk of armor, it's very similar to impact in that regards. So I'm just taking a look at the weapons that actually have some ability to disable enemies. So I have belt feds shooting heat or hesh. These are armed with heat, but generally I like hesh more, although heat tends heat tends to work better against very dense enemy vehicles that don't have any air gaps to start spalling. And then here I have armor piercing shells of different varieties coming out of larger autoloaders. These aren't rail accelerated, so I have them set up like this, where they have a moderately high shell velocity. The kinetic damage is just coming from the actual warhead bodies, and then they have an armor piercing head. I can make these solid bodies, like some amount of these solid bodies, and keep some HE warhead body. It would lose a lot of firepower, and it would gain a little bit of penetration, and I usually don't consider that trade-off to be worth it. I think you do need rail acceleration to get an APHE shell that is using solid bodies to be worthwhile using. The alternative would be pure solid shot, where I would just use either a sabo head or sabo bodies. Given the incredibly low rate of fire, I don't like that because it has to actually hit the important component, as opposed to the shell, which just needs to come close to it. The other downside about this is that... Okay, this is not the actual shell speed. Um, these shells should be going significantly faster. There's probably probably some mistake here. Oh, it's because the barrel's too short to actually um, expel all of the propellant. Let's make sure my shell speed is high enough now. Okay, now my shell speed is correct and the firepower is also the correct number. So this is a fairly large gun for five firepower. I did make the barrel a little bit long, so this could be a slightly better number. I think I could get away with only two barrels instead of three. But looking at about 500 materials for, per firepower, that's the same here. And that's the same here, except these get remarkably close to the firepower that these guns have, just by being way smaller. So for a plane like this, where space is highly limited, and I'm worried about the expense of armor and thrust components to carry the volume of weapon that I have. I really, really want to prioritize small, dense weapons like this. So I strongly prefer using these belt feds over these autoloaders. These autoloaders do have some advantage that they have a long reloading time. So this plane can just turn very briefly to fire at the enemy, take a shot, and then do some sort of evasive action while it's reloading. On the other hand, if I use these belt feds, well, these have 100 seconds of firing time uptime, um, and it takes time for them to turn and then retreat. 
So these want to be doing long attack runs, and they want to start reloading as soon as the attack run is over. Even though they have 100 seconds of firing time, I want them to use every possible moment of retreating to reload. And once they've committed to reloading, they have to reload. So it's a, li it's a little annoying to deal with. The long approach that you need to actually get off a meaningful number of bullets is also annoying and makes the craft vulnerable. So I would prefer not to do this. It would give me craft with higher stability on the attack run, so the shots themselves could be made to be a bit more accurate. And I could generally have them fire from further away. So, th so there are upsides here, and I'm not saying that this is a non-viable weapon choice. It's not going to be the one that I'm using, but it is certainly viable. You could do a similar thing like this with one meter autoloaders, but you have enforced downtime anyway, so you might as well use belt feds. You could do very short spurts of fire with very short retreats, but the problem is changing from attacking to retreating takes time to turn the craft around, so you're just losing efficiency the shorter you make those attack runs, and at a certain point it just feels bad. Another choice I have are missiles, which are very nice because you don't even have to be pointing at the enemy to fire them. And these are remote guidance. The um, And the reason they're remote guidance is because I'm using the shaped charge head here. So that's the way to get into heat. And heat is what I'd want to use for a craft that's disabling enemies with maybe a little bit of an EMP charge as a hedge. Um, there aren't really... <laughs> there aren't really much in the way of alternatives. The one being a beam rider. It can be a little bit tricky to get a beam rider to work properly off of a platform like this. So I'm not going to try using the beam rider. And I'm not going to be using the remote guidance because I'll probably probably be operating around 0% stability. And I'll have to deal with this, which is going to be worse than just the percent inaccuracy that I get from um, low stability because I'd be engaging at close ranges. These are the same, but in the small missile pla package, which is basically just a little bit denser, but less damage per missile and has a 50% higher GVP cost per launcher. So this totals at 1.5 GPP and this is just one. And then this is the alternative for you have a radar seeker or some other seeker at the tip. It means that you can't use remote guidance anymore. So this one's pure EMP. I don't actually have a huge problem with this and I'm not going to use this for a reason that also disqualifies these other missiles. And that's, this is going to be the only craft carrying non-plasma weaponry on the carrier group. This means that if the enemy has anti-missile systems, they will all engage this fairly small group of fighter-like aircraft. And it'll make these missiles highly ineffective. Missiles are really only efficient if you're saturating the anti-missile defense that, you, that the enemy craft has. Missiles are incredibly devastating, and I think that they're the most powerful weapon in the game. They're also the weapon that has the best counters to it. So you either need to engage an enemy that just doesn't have missile anti-missile systems, or you have to throw so many missiles at them that you overwhelm their anti-missile systems, and then each additional missile is just incredibly effective. That's usually done by throwing decoy missiles that have huge numbers of solid bodies, or just staggering an insane quantity of missiles from a bunch of angles. None of those are going to be options for this craft, so I have no way to defeat anti-missile systems, and therefore these aren't good. This is sort of similar, that if I'm against lambs, they're just going to fry all of these giant shells that can be detected from a million miles away and have very little health because they're not solid shot. These belt feds get around that problem, so they're still in the picture because of that since especially this one with 50 millimeter high fire rate moderately high shell speed lambs are going to be pretty much ineffective against this so this would be a particularly good choice if i was going to go with an aps configuration however i'm going to go with particle cannons 
it's a little bit more on theme. And that can be incredibly devastating for a very small volume. So the upfront cost of this is about 10,000. It's not including the batteries. And I do need enough batteries to actually fire the thing, which is going to push up the cost a little bit. It makes the material per firepower look very good because I set the overclocking up. However, that doubles the firepower, but it quadruples the energy consumption. I'm not that concerned about the energy consumption of these. I'm planning on having this be very small compared to the overall consumption of the carrier. And they're more to just poke a few small holes and disable things than they are to actually destroy all of the armor on the enemy craft, which might be prohibitively expensive at this type of overclocking. I do have this set at 10% focus, which puts an insane amount of damage through at 56,000. It has incredible consequences to the inaccuracy, so these would only be capable of shooting at capital ships. I'm probably still going to do that. 50% focus knocks down the firepower significantly, bringing it closer to 35,000. At 50% focus, this is the amount of metal that it'll punch through, and with 60 AP, it'll punch through a significant amount of heavy armor as well. These metal blocks are how much armor I would get through with these guns, so these guns won't even take out a single layer of heavy armor, although the explosions on these would probably finish it off. And I could alternatively split this up into multiple lenses. This is using a short range lens, which also gives the most damage with a 20% damage buff compared to the medium range lenses, but significantly more fall off. So you do actually have to use this at close range or the damage buff just isn't worth it. But I do think that operating like this on a small, close-range, harassing craft is what I'm going to go with. Now, this does take 340,000 energy a shot. So, you know, looking at... Looking at the number of batteries I'd have to put on, it, something like this is bare minimum. And then it'll only be able to take one shot and it'll need more energy to reload. So there are some downsides there. The craft may have to be programmed to retreat towards the carrier until it's gotten an energy refill. I'll do enough testing to figure out if that's actually a concern after I've built the carrier, which you know, I'm building up a lot of problems here for future Bungalow Bill. All of these craft have some issues remaining for future Bungalow Bill. Uh, future Bungalow Bill will go and solve those probably. So anyway, I'm actually gonna throw a few different crafts together with a few of these solutions. Not these, even though these are the runner-up, just because these would take me the most time. All of the other ones are very easy to slap together. Getting this right would actually take me a bit. So I'll do that and then I'll be back in a moment. All right, now I've gone ahead and spawned in three happy little fighter variants. I'll pause the game so they stop moving quite as quickly. This one is painted, which means it's the pack variant. It's the only one I've painted, although I have not decoed it yet, which I'll probably do later. This one has missiles on top, so obviously it's the missile variant, and we'll look at that first. Cost 53,000, firepower 55. So this one's relatively expensive, and that definitely tells me that the jet and just overall armor components are a much smaller percentage cost of it compared to, well, the APS variant, which we'll take a look at in a second. I did this one with vertical launch missiles. These are just big frag sticks. They could easily be changed out for EMP, but they're frag at the moment. The APS variant gets away with just ammo here. For missiles, I had to toss them up here as well. I highly suspect that this is gonna blow through into the missiles. Heavy armor might stop this. If I was going with this variant, I would use heavy armor here instead. I did a few tests with this vehicle. Against things that have no defenses for missiles, it's very efficient as you normally expect out of missiles. Against things that do well, it doesn't do so well. And as I said before, that's not the reason that's the reason I won't be using it, but I still wanted to put it together for a cost and structure comparison so I could look at what that would mean for placements of the ammo load, overall cost, firepower, that sort of thing, whether or not it could reasonably saturate enemy defenses. 
It can't, but it can try at least. Here I have the APS variant. It costs significantly less at 20,000. And additionally, it's only got about nine firepower versus the 55 of the missile variant. And this is very reflective of how much damage it actually deals. The firepower numbers traditionally have often been a suggestion, but I think they've been honed in reasonably well over the years. So it's a pretty good suggestion nowadays. What that means is that at the firepower per cost we're looking at, well, there's probably around 5,000 materials in the APS system, maybe a hair less. That means that three quarters of the cost in this craft is support systems. It's armor, it's surge protectors, it's control services, it's AI, it's the, it's the custom jet engine. This is just not the place that I want to be with a build. If I was to build something like this, it would need different ratios because this is just a huge waste. And finally, we have the pack variant. The pack variant's the only one that actually has detection because it's the only one that I really, really did a lot of tests with. So I wanted the ability to target different block types. I meant to switch these back to physical cameras because I was messing around with targeting hot blocks versus clusters of blocks. Ideally, this thing is gonna be getting its targeting information from other structures, but the detection on this is pretty pathetic. So it's useful while this thing is loitering around but I wanted a little bit more backup detection when it was pointing at the enemy. I'll fix that later. And then we have the actual components. So as you'd expect, big block of pack components here and a lot of batteries in this thing. These are very hungry per shot. I could reduce the charge time and then I could reduce the batteries I'd lose a little bit of firepower because packs are less efficient at lower charge times. However, I really want the punch that it gives and currently I'm just willing to pay that price. So this thing runs about 41,000 materials, about 80 firepower, although there will be a significant running cost. I also took advantage of the fact that local weapon controllers, again, can connect two blocks in cardinal directions to hide it just a little bit past the short range lens. As for whether or not this actually makes a concrete difference, no, it probably doesn't. But I've got it paused so it does not shrink blocks, but I still wanted to do it anyway. So those are the things that I've built and I did do off-camera testing of all of them and I'm not gonna do on-camera testing of them. This video is already getting long enough. I'm just gonna do on-camera testing of this pack. I'll do it against Generally, larger vehicles is really what I'm interested in. The ability of this fleet to get some damage into larger vehicles, disable weapon systems, movement systems, maybe a lucky shot could take out AI. Some of the larger plasma weapons are already just going to obliterate small craft if they hit them. So I'm just going to be testing this against what it should be good against. And if it is good against what it should be good against, then I'm going to keep it and use it in the fleet. So. In a little bit, I'll get back with the testing. Okay, as I mentioned before, I'm gonna spawn in the tier for the first test, and let's just see what happens. I have my craft on god mode, so I'm not really interested in how much damage they take or how well they take it. I'm interested in if they're as dodgy as they need to be based on the attacks coming into them. Currently, the Sea Wiz is not doing great. That doesn't mean it'll always not do great. So at least one of them hit well. And these look like pieces of rubber, which, unless there's wonky surge protector shenanigans going on, usually means that that grazed the AI compartment. So I see an entry wound here, and that comes out the bottom. So that's not the one that hit the AI compartment. The AI compartment is more in this region. So yeah, here's the vertical train of blocks that we looked at earlier, and there's another scattering, and we've got about this much separation between them which means we should be in this zone. Now, I didn't see exactly where the pack trails were lined up, so I don't know where to begin looking exactly at the target to see the entry wounds. And there's a lot of smoke, which doesn't help things. So I'll just let things go. If there's, an, if there's another wound on the bottom, oh, there is another wound on the bottom, isn't there? I was gonna say, if there's another wound on the bottom, then I can take a look at it. In fact, there are two more wounds on the bottom. It looks like both of those shots went all the way through. Mmm, yes. So 
we were <laughs> we were this close to one-shotting the tier with this plane. And you can make that very reliable if you just click on things with your mouse, although not with the inaccuracy we have on these weapons currently, but uh, that's usually why I don't manually aim. You can obliterate craft way too easily like that. So obviously, this will actually show us where we went into. That's probably why I couldn't find it. That would have not been the easiest to see, especially with all of the gun smoke over here, and especially because I thought that we came in closer to here. Well, anyway, let's put a few more holes in her. So obviously we have the sort of damage potential that I'm looking for. These are the sort of harassment craft that I want. They're circling close, which means usually only small guns can actually maintain targeting on them fairly well. If the gun doesn't rotate fast enough, then it's gonna have trouble locking so these little sea whiz cannons can engage them. However, they're not doing so very effectively. There are craft that will very easily destroy these in Neater, even if they're not the main target. I think things like the Crucible and the Sovereign, it's a good thing I have them on God Mode. I am going to set them so that they only use one side, so that they won't rotate in opposite directions like this. Because now that I don't have that set, they always, always pick opposite sides to rotate. But uh, things like the Crucible and the Sovereign, I think, have very powerful lasers that they use to destroy uh, small vehicles in the fleet. So we trimmed a barrel there, and we... Yeah, we put two different shots down here. At least one of those was probably something that clipped the barrel. Let's give a few more shots. I have seen these one-shot tier turrets before while I was doing my testing. It's very rare. The target clusters of blocks does not seem to go for the tier turrets as much as I'd like. Presumably that was... I mean, those were APS components, but they came from the back, and they didn't look like the components that would be in the Sea Whiz, so I don't actually know what we took out there. Unless we took out, like, unless I wasn't paying enough attention, we actually did put holes through the through the main guns. This is still a lot of firepower, though. I'm not sure how real all of it is. Yeah, so we've definitely hit the rear engines a few times. Now the tier's not moving at all anymore. If we hit the main engine, I think she'll capsize because a lot of the Steel Striders vehicles require active support to stay upright because of how narrow they are and how top-heavy they are. But if we're lucky, we'll get to see a really good shot. I haven't really put any into the main guns yet. For some reason, we're just absolutely destroying the butt of the tier. Surge protectors, a few more steam components. So that was definitely back towards the drive engines again, which we've been hitting over and over. Obviously, it's still nice to take out the drive components of an enemy vehicle. You can't really complain about that. It would be nicer if we didn't keep hitting already destroyed components, though, and if we didn't always keep coming in from the back, which probably make that more likely. A lot of surge protectors. Based on the entry wounds, or not the entry wounds, based on the relative points of entry, I was really hoping we managed to hit a turret. I really want to see these hit the tier near a turret at least once. Unfortunately, it looks like we do a circle roughly every 20 seconds, and we're always coming in over the back. If the tier was moving, that wouldn't be the case. It um, affects how long it takes us to circuit her. But with the tier moving, we're or not moving at all, we're just coming in over the back over and over again. Maybe, maybe they'll choose a different point this time. Okay, here we go. There's a little more potential to go in for the turret caps now. But the aim points look pretty similar. They are set to target clusters of blocks, so I would have thought at this point they would have stopped hitting the back. And in past runs, I've never seen them target the back this much. I've seen them take a fair number of shots at the turrets. So, just bad luck, but I'm not going to film this one again at this point, so that's just bad luck I'm going to live with. Okay, we must have hit the main ammo storage there. I'm going to check that out, and then we're going to spawn in the pyre for some more tests. Heavy, arc heavy armor 
steam engines. Those steam engines are presumably the main engines, which are slightly further forward. And there is uh, what is probably now somewhat porous heavy armor blocks. Where a lot of the ammo used to be, this is what we hit earlier, and not in the same way we hit earlier, right? Wow, we have we have really turned this area into Swiss cheese. The, the exact targeting has left a little bit to be desired, but you can't really argue with the results that much. The tier is not going to be very functional from many of those shots have really just destroyed critical systems. So moving on. Let's do some target practice on the Pyre now to see if the weapons are well tuned for that or not. The Pyre is a much bigger chunk of heavy armor than the tier and more damage per shot is going to be necessary. Also, for some reason, these drone or these nukes go after my drones instead of this. Most of the time, not all the time. I don't know what's up with their target prioritization behavior. Maybe they just don't have a card at all. So that was really good. So we took out some APS components and it looks like it went in through the upper deck somewhere. Yep, so it went in through here. Since it took out APS components, it must have shot the gap between these wedges. This must actually count as airspace for packs. And then went in here and did something. These guys rotate, so there's no real way I can tell what damage was dealt to the turrets. And I do know that some damage was dealt because I definitely see big chunks of APS components falling out. And another big shot to the other side. Mostly heavy armor, a very small amount of APS components in there. Depending on what side you hit the turrets from, you either have to go through immense amounts of heavy armor, or you can just completely destroy them. Completely destroying them takes a lot of luck. That went th that actually did respectable damage, but mostly went through the bridge, so I doubt there's anything important that was taken out there. One shot whiffed, and the other shot looks like it took out a... Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called, the large missile hatch. So one of these guys is not working properly anymore, probably. It'll still work, it just might be missing. If this if it's remote guided, it'll still work fine. It'll be missing guidance otherwise, though. That went in right through the top of the bridge, probably mostly took out armor. That one went in through the front of the craft, which probably means missile components, if I was lucky. Or just armor on the top side, if I wasn't. So at the very least, these still have enough power to deal with pyre armor, but it's not excessive anymore, like the tier. Which means I don't think I'm going to split the beams up anymore. Yeah, neither of those overpenetrated. The target clusters of blocks, in this case, is working really well to take out these guns. It hasn't gotten any over what I'd consider an overwhelmingly lucky shot. If I wasn't letting the pyre fire, it would probably be easier for me to tell where these shots went through, because I cannot figure it out. The other thing is that the turret caps themselves have decos on them, which means find if I did hit the actual turret cap, I would not know. Yeah, I can't see it, but I might have just shot decos on the turret cap. Oh, there's steam boilers coming out now. That's always a great way to cripple the target, taking out steam components. One of the two shots hit and didn't overpenetrate. If both hit, would have done about 80,000. Barely overpenetrated, 80,000 is about the maximum that you get. APS components, jet components, material container. Oh, there goes the entire turret. Yeah, this is... Oh, it only chops the neck off. Killing the turret base is totally viable for these types of weapons, though, because APS components don't really stop these beams. That was massive overkill, but we hit the front. Just knocked out a little bit of heavy armor. A little bit of metal. 
Those were not overkill, and I missed them. That ripped down almost the entire length of the craft, but looks like it went through very unimportant components that are in this very, very central area of the spine for some reason. I think there's a little separator between two symmetrical halves of this craft in some places. Probably one good shot and one missed shot there. Same with that. One shot that was good into the top and one shot that missed. Both of those still mostly took out armor components. I think I see one gauge piece. I do think that I need to make it so that these favor one side over the other, so that they don't circle in opposite directions ever. That is an issue. Good damage there, but that's into the heavily armored front. These things have enough armor or have enough piercing to get through sides of enemy craft, but not the front. If I'm shooting frontal armor or something like the pyre, I'm not gonna get through it with these kinds of packs. You need like capital ship levels of spinal packs. With this, 40 firepower per pack, 20 second charge time. You're getting through side armor, top armor, back armor, that sort of stuff. Or in a smaller craft or a broadsider like the tier, you might be able to punch through both armor as well. But in a front sider like this, you are not punching through front sider armor. Those were missile ejectors, which I think. I don't know if the front missiles have them. I know that these reverse fired interceptors have them. Ooh, we got we got either ammo storage there or unejected turrets. Are these turrets not ejected? I know these guys are. These guys might be unejected. And we can go right through there into the steam stuff and jet stuff. That's pretty nice. Not very common. Those are much bigger turrets than I realized that they were. So yeah, these weapons look a little bit more anemic against something like the pyre compared to the tier. And to some extent that's good. I don't want these weapons to be too big. And even against something as chonky as the pyre, they're still chipping away at firepower. These two things together, that, well, they only cost 80,000, so I'm not expecting them to kill a craft like this. Hopefully I can get them a little bit... That's the main body for some reason. Hopefully I can get them a little bit dodgier. I think right now they're taking more fire. So now that they've had more time to shoot, this is about what they've settled on against the target that they're efficient against. It'll be even worse against ones that they're inefficient against. I'm expecting to be able to get about six to 700 energy per material. So this is actually reasonably efficient. It certainly could be worse. 0.5 is where I'm starting to look a little shifty eyed at it. But since I'm gonna have a lot of space on the tier, not on the tier, on the carrier, I'm gonna have room for relatively efficient steam turbines. So I don't think I'm gonna have any cost issues operating these. I think they just still need a few more tweaks, some decoration, some testing where they're actually taking enemy fire, where they have uh, access to better detection. Currently, the detection mast on this craft is pretty bad, and their own detection is also pretty bad. They just have some IR cameras to make sure that they can actually target, cluster, or target hot blocks. Previously, it was visual cameras to make sure that they could target clusters of blocks. I switched them back to clusters of blocks and forgot to switch the cameras. Two visual cameras on the front actually gives them moderate detection accuracy while they're coming in, so hopefully that'll clean things up a little bit. Take a look. Yeah, these are going to be operating at 0% like stability all the time. Will it tell me the inaccuracy that it adds? Yeah, 0.4%. I do not care about that compared to the fact that I'm losing, okay, 10 meters of accuracy at 500 meters is bad. That's as bad as if I was using um, the missiles, which I really didn't like that from. So I might have to put the focus up a little bit more. It still seems to be working okay. And uh, these things shoot at under 500 meters. So it's not horrible, but yeah, I might need to turn that up to like 20% focus and see where I am. There's gonna be a lot of a lot of 
testing more than I can put on camera. So I'm going to cut things here, build the carrier, and then tweak and decorate all of the craft afterwards. So I hope you've enjoyed watching, and I'll see you in the future.